Has Russia chosen the worst possible time to launch a major offensive? Plus, are they going to be holding elections in occupied Ukraine? I'm Paul, U.S. Army combat veteran. It's December 10th, 2023. This is your daily Ukraine update. Let's get into it. Okay, first, we're taking a look at the control map, and there are a couple of changes here. First, south near Robtina, you can see Russian forces uh, pushing across this rough uh, undulating terrain here seizing this roadway out of Novo Prokopivka. We can see this is this is terrain that Ukraine has held for at least uh, probably 2 or 3 months now, probably longer than that honestly. Um and it's the road to Novo Prokopivka, uh, kind of the the apex of their offensive uh where they really stood at the gates of kind of capturing this town uh but but we're blunted by the Russian defensive line. So the fact is, Russia is rolling this back. And as as we always talk about in this channel, uh, salience are inherently unsustainable. You can see uh, the Ukrainian forces defending Robtina are surrounded by Russian forces on three sides. And so it it's not totally irrational to say, oh, that Russia is going to probably push them into Robtina. It might even push them out of it, right? When you zoom out, you're like, okay, in the grand scheme of things, what does it all mean? Again, at this point, we we can say it doesn't mean much, right? This little salient was uh, captured at a, at a tremendous cost, but it didn't result in a substantive breakthrough of Russian lines. It came really close at times, um, but it just never quite uh, transitioned to a real offensive uh, uh, breakthrough. Now, near the town of Bodanivka, we see something similar. This, for the record, is just on the northern flank of Bakhmut, north uh, west of Bakhmut a little bit. You can see here uh, these forces near Bodanivka, uh, Russian forces advancing, again, up to this reservoir. Uh, while they are pushing Russian or Ukrainian forces back, you see that this reservoir is kind of a natural obstacle, and as is this uh, small canal here. And it's like this canal is likely frozen, and that's probably facilitated some Russian offensive action, but this obstacle uh, here is kind of a problem for Ukrainian forces, right? Imagine you're one of the forces in this windbreak, and you have to your resupply routes have to go either through this uh, windbreak here or around either side of this reservoir. Uh, now this is a Russian problem. You can see that Russian forces are on one side of the reservoir. Ukrainian forces are going to end up on another side, and it's somewhat more challenging now. It's somewhat more equal. Um, it's less of an obstacle for one side and a and a uh, an anvil, so to speak, for the other. So. Again, this isn't to say this isn't offensive action. This is, but is it part of a larger Russian strategy? It's part of a larger Russian strategic choice to go on the offensive. And we're going to talk about why that is in a little bit. But the big thing to take away here is just that this isn't part of like a larger Russian uh, tactical campaign to seize the areas around Bakhmut, right? They've, they've sort of pushed in Klachivka a little bit. Now they're pushing in this Bodianivka, but it, it's just them taking targets of opportunity. That's my interpretation anyway, that there's they're trying to just sort of put pressure across the front lines in a very Soviet kind of way in the hopes that one of these little zones, they're going to result in a breakthrough. Uh, what's really interesting is you're seeing substantive Russian progress near this town of Rose Dolivka. You can see uh, what had been a few weeks ago, a Ukrainian kind of uh, breakthrough is probably too strong a word, but uh, a offensive action that pushed Russian forces towards Solidar, uh, you could see this has been entirely reversed, right? Russian lines restored um, and Ukrainian defensive positions anchored here at Rolstolivka and Vesile. Uh, so this is, again, uh, also anchored by this canal here. So a... a, a move by Russia to sort of restore the status quo. Um, but Ukraine, again, maintaining very robust positions. And you can see here, north of this river canal, there's a lot of hilly terrain. Likely, Ukrainian artillery is sitting all in these hills, uh, just going to absolutely crush any Russians that try to push further. So take away from all this, when we look over at the combat map, you can see uh, Ukrainian military reporting just 45 combat engagements, but uh, each one of them carrying some significance, right, in and around Avdivka, uh, and particularly in and around Bakhmut, as well as, well, here's that offensive action near Novo Prokopivka. And the thing to take away from this is, again, that while the weather is absolutely 
brutal here. You're not going to see worse weather in Ukraine. Uh, Russia has still chosen this to to launch a fairly substantive offensive. But I think what sort of defines it is that this isn't a mechanized offensive. It's not like Avdivka. Um, you're seeing small sort of piecemeal gains, just picking apart wherever there's low-hanging fruit. Uh, this isn't part of a larger campaign to sort of break Ukrainian lines. It's just to ri- raise the rate of attrition. Uh, if you are feeling ground down by the holidays, certainly you aren't alone. Um, the and you probably need a little bit of energy to get through it. Uh, that's why I wanted to talk to you about Strike Gum. Strike Gum is, of course, my energy gum. Uh, I it was inspired by my time in Afghanistan, where I drank all these energy drinks to sort of well get a source of caffeine that I could use on combat patrols and to stay focused. Uh, you know, during these like twelve hour days. But energy drinks are gross. They're loaded with sugar. They taste disgusting. They're carbonated, and now they're like four or five bucks a pop. So I worked with a manufacturer right here in the USA to produce Strike Gum. 90 milligrams of caffeine in this one little piece here. That's as much as a monster, as much as an amp energy. Um, And best of all, it has zero sugar, refreshing mint flavor. So it doesn't even taste, uh, it won't even leave your breath tasting gross. Um, And of course... Uh, 50% of the profits from this first production run, I'm donating to charities that support Ukrainian civilians who've been injured or displaced in the conflict. So if you want to, uh, check us out, go to strikegum.com. Uh, obviously you can try an individual pack, uh, or if you are a serious, uh, caffeine or energy drink addict, uh, and looking to save some money and find just a healthier, better tasting alternative, you can check out the tray. That's 75 pieces of gum, the equivalent of 75 energy drinks. I, I actually, I'm, I'm curious myself. I haven't actually looked this up. Uh, 75 energy drinks, right? Assuming you're paying uh, four bucks a pop is going to run you $300, guys. Uh, this works out to, uh, you know, like 90 cents a piece, even less if you have a military discount or use one of our uh, other discounts that we have for uh, like signing up for uh, the sales notifications and that sort of thing. So check us out, strikegum.com. And thanks to the like, uh, we actually broke 2,500 orders. Uh, So thank you guys so much. Uh, Clearly we see tons of you guys have been reordering, uh, which, which, which makes me feel good. It makes me feel like you guys also have realized that you don't need to be drinking these like overpriced energy drinks. Uh, There's a better alternative out there. Okay, let's talk about why the Russian forces are going on offense. Well, they have, indeed, committed to offensive operations in multiple sectors of the front during what ISW calls the period of the most challenging weather of the fall-winter season. Why? Well, the ISW links this to the Russian presidential elections. Now, here's the thing that's kind of dumb. Uh, Putin is going to win the presidential elections. It's because Russia is an autocracy. They don't have free and fair elections. Um, the notable election opposition, Alexei Navalny, is in jail and has been for a better part of two years, I think. But so then why then, if it's a foregone conclusion, does Russia feel the need to hold presidential elections? Because oftentimes I think this is still part of a political mobilization for uh, Putin, and Putin does allow some level of opposition party to exist. They just can never get anywhere near the actual levers of government. They're never going to sit in a meaningful position in the Russian Duma. They're never going to uh, have numbers significant enough to control a, even a subset of states, but sometimes they are allowed to sort of have a, a public profile, though obviously Putin's public uh, campaigns are the most well-funded, the most well-attended, etc. And so But when you have this big political mobilization, it can be dangerous for people to start asking questions and to at least make an evaluation of, okay, yeah, there's this fake election, but, you know, Putin is telling you the things he's done. And what you don't want to do is walk by a a big grave monument in your town to all the dead soldiers in this current war and then go, well, Putin says he's winning, but why are all these dead dudes here? Why is a third of the men in our town dead? Uh, and I think the reality is that Putin wants to show that he's winning. And the fact is he can't, right? They really, Russia really believed that that counteroffensive was going was gonna, to was gonna mess them up. They were even preparing the information space for Russia to fail. Um, and so the fact that they've blunted it, uh, and now they're trying to retake territory. Now, they haven't retaken even a single village, uh, but 
they are taking, you know, empty fields here and there, uh, not part of any larger campaign, but doing so will enable Russia and Putin to tout his uh, battlefield victories, particularly because he claims it's against uh, all of NATO, right? Despite the fact that obviously uh, the forces are 99.999% Ukrainian. Uh, and again, the fact that Russia is throwing its its troops and soldiers into this uh, is why I'm pretty dismissive of these gains, because the reality is that troops in winter, they just don't have that much stamina. They don't have much pep in their steps, so to speak. And if you force them to do offensive operations, they're not going to stage a major breakthrough, especially given that Russian armored forces in Avdivka have been ground down to basically nothing. And Russia would actually be wise to kind of dial down the battlefield pace because they have to keep bringing fresh troops in. And they have the ability, if they were to just slow their their attrition rate somewhat, they would have the ability to actually use greater numbers of troops in the spring when offensive is going to be more uh, tactically or operationally feasible. Um, now, of course, ISW arguing as they did last year that once there's a hard freeze and the ground remains frozen, uh, it won't be as muddy and mechanized operations can resume. But again, we've seen mechanized operations and they just don't seem to work. Not in the face of the large-scale kamikaze drone attacks, not in the face of large-scale uh, you know, drone observation, uh, precision artillery, um, you know, the... the some people are like, oh, the era of the tank is over. Guys, the era of the tank might be over. You know, if you can basically thwart um, entire armored and mechanized formations by using um, scatterable mines, like cheap mines the size of a dinner plate, and uh, drones that you can get from Radio Shack uh, or whatever Radio Shack's successor is, uh, dude, why would you send a, a, a $10 million tank into the battlefield if uh, $30 of drones and explosives can render it uh, a smoking hulk in a field? So the, that's the billion dollar question right now, right? It doesn't matter if you wait. It doesn't matter if you wait for perfect conditions for armored warfare because armored warfare doesn't matter. Uh, you heard it here first, guys. Anyway, the only other news story on here, Ukraine reminding everyone that Russia, this Russian election is going to have some new oblasts. Uh, that's right. Occupied Ukraine is going to, Russia is going to force these Ukrainians to vote in their election. And, you know, listen, uh, there's a lot of collaborators and they can get, they can go pound sand. But if you're a Ukrainian civilian and you're living in this area, guess what, guys? It doesn't matter if you vote or not. If, if, if Russia's like, you can go to vote or you're going to go to a Russian military prison. Just write Putin on your ballot, put it in the box, and get get on with your life, okay? That's just the way you got to do things. You got to do what you got to do to survive in this world. But Russia, again, Ukraine, the government of Ukraine saying, reminding us that, hey, this is illegally occupied territory. Uh, you can't, right? Uh, so, you know, these these are, are occupied regions, uh, Ukrainian citizens under occupation. They can't a vote can't be valid, right? You can't, if you have, if you're living in like under military law, then what are you voting for? You don't have rights to influence your governance, your, the people governing you. You're governed by the military, an unelected entity. Uh, so anyway, that is, that is the reality, right? Even if every one of these people voted, uh, they wouldn't have the authority to remove the military from their region. So what's the point of voting, right? Anyway, that's all I had, guys. Thanks so much to the members of Colonel Tier members of CombatVetNews.com. Thank you to our Lieutenant Tier members and all the members of CombatVetNews.com. Uh, we had some awesome videos for you. I couldn't do this without you. Thanks so much. See you in the next one. Cheers.